Fred Fioreda, this is Chiara Nicoletti from the 77th Venice International Film Festival. I'm with Cathy Walterstone, uh, among the protagonists with Vanessa Kirby of Mona Fastworth, The World to Come, in competition here. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So, first of all, I like what um, Mona wrote about the film she wrote. This is a love story that captured the soul and celebration of two people finding each other. Mm -hmm. So, uh, was that what you breathed when you read the script? I suppose it's, it's beautifully articulated. I think what I felt when I first read it was the was maybe just what I connect with first, which is the the pain and the emotional life of the character. So them finding each other, so in a sense, it's the result. But um, A, it comes at a price. There's, there's this great love and there's this significant loss. So that struck me. But also, prior to the great love, you meet a woman who who has no doubt of what her future holds. Mm -hmm. It will be relentless, it will be lonely, um, although she's not alone. She is alone in the sense that she has no real connection on an intellectual level, on an emotional level. Um, she knows there will be um, lots of stress, uncertainty, pressures, hard labor, and that's the whole future for her. That's how her life looks to her, and, and she has no doubt that's the way it will be. Um, I was so struck by that when I first read it, that a person with no prospects, um, and then this love comes in. But that, I remember when I first read it, that's what really struck me, was the, was the depth of suffering and, um, and loss and um, a certain future with no hope in it. <laughs> really, uh, I was so overwhelmed by that one. What's beautiful about this story that is that they find a connection between each other that was maybe it's still difficult to find today, but that, that was technically impossible at that time. You know, mm. when you're so isolated that mm. you couldn't even imagine to mm. have a, this I connection mm. with somebody. It's, it kind of heightens what we all do experience, no? In that you feel something. There's, there's always an element of risk. I'm going to admit it to another person. Life is not tidy, right? There's these moments that are they're really scary to show someone how you feel. Certainly in this period, um, not just within this relationship, but within all the relationships, they didn't necessarily have the tools we have today about uh, 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 tools for expressing feelings. So you see with all of the characters in this beautiful script, you see the ways in which they, they are repressed, uh, the way they use language in a very economic way, um, not, not giving too much away, not very rarely putting uh, words to their feelings. You see the frustrations, you see the challenges, but you don't hear them, right? These characters, they don't communicate in this way. And so, so to be in a culture, and to be in a period in time where people just didn't talk that way, and then to be falling in love with a woman and not have any frame of reference for this love, what do you do? How do you express it? What do you say? And I just thought that the, that Ron and Jim, the writers, they handled that so truthfully, or seemed to be truthfully, because we don't really know. We don't, we don't know about these stories. It's an imagined story um, of this period. But I, the ways in which they kind of danced around one another, trying to sort of dare themselves and dare the other to reveal a bit. That, that whole period in the middle of the film when they're discovering this love and figuring out how to admit it, I thought was so beautifully written and, and really fun to play. Did, did Mona uh, plan from the beginning that you had to be the voice of you know, mm. the feelings that, that you could experience you know, everything through? Mm. I think um, I think before even Mona saw the script, that was an element in the script, the voiceover, really important with this film. 
uh, often voiceover is kind of a problem-solving solution people add to films when they don't make sense in post-production, but this was so deeply integrated into the film. And, and I think particularly because Abigail, um, as Tally says later in the film, is someone uh, who, um, well, she says, in my experience, those who feel, feel the, um, who say the least don't necessarily feel the least. This is Abigail, right? She is full of feeling, full of life, but has a very, very limited voice. Um, so the voiceover lets us into a side of her that you would just never know about if we didn't have the voice of it because the character does not reveal it in the scenes. It was really fun to play with that and a very delicate balance for me to make sure that I was holding enough back in the scenes that we really needed that voiceover, you know, because if I gave away too much, which can sometimes be a temptation for an actor because we love to, <laughs> we love to show the life of the character, right? If I gave away too much, then it would feel redundant. The voiceover would be boring. So that was a really interesting challenge for me as well. And um, yeah. <laughs> That's one last thing that I noticed that I really like that it's uh, there is a, a moment in which Abigail is uh, talking about her mother mm -hmm. and in a way is talking about uh, what you said before that she already knows what her place in the world mm -hmm. is supposed to be. Uh, there's something very, uh, very important for us right now. I think that uh, uh, looking back at where we were mm -hmm. to appreciate and analyze it, appreciate it right mm -hmm. now. It's something that the film does, mm -hmm. even if it's not the focus of it, but mm -hmm. there's also mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this a part. lot of parallels here. Also with the natural world. In the film we see it, the natural world is threatening, it's uncertain. We've then enjoyed this, since the Industrial Revolution, a sort of period where we think we can master the world, we can uh, be cavalier with it. Now it's saying, no, I am, I am unpredictable. I am a, a threat to you as well, if you don't obviously respect it. So there's that parallel. And I think um, to your point, uh, yeah, um, there are periods of tolerance, even even if people are suffering greatly during those periods, periods where for some reason the collective unconscious sort of says, this is without, there's no hope. It, the way it was for my mother is the way it will be for my, my child. And then there are moments where the collective unconscious says, fuck no, no more. And we are in one of those moments today. Um, and the reason we got from the mid-1800s to now and women have choice and the power to vote in most of large parts of the world and, um, and have liberty is because somewhere between that period and this period there were moments of that where that collect collective rose up and said, fuck no, right? So, so it's, it's, it's wonderful to be in a moment where we are rising up and saying things need to change. That's the best last question, last <laughs> answer I have ever had. My name is Mipasio. Thank you so much, Thank Catherine you. Waterston, for being Thank with you. us and talking about The World to Come by Mona Festival in competition at the 77th Venice International Film Festival. I'm Chiara Nicoletti. This is Fred, the Festival Insider.